Kia good evening. Fonterra have shaved a dollar off their forecast farm gate milk price, dropping it from $7 to 6 per kilogram of milk solids for the 2014 to 15 season. They've also announced a dividend payout of 20 to 25 cents per share, bringing the total forecast cash payout up to $6.25 for the current season. The declining farm gate milk price reflects continuing volatility, with the global dairy trade index falling 16% since June 1st. A build-up on inventory in China, falling demand in some emerging markets due to high commodity prices and a strong New Zealand dollar are all factors, according to Chairman John Wilson. Farmer cash flows will be impacted and caution is urged with on-farm budgets. The final launch of the European Space Agency's Ariane 5 rocket was tracked today from the Arua Satellite Ground Station. This final launch marks the end of a six-year relationship with the European Space Agency. Venture Southland's project manager Robin McNeil was on hand to explain the mission earlier today as the rocket and its payload were tracked over Arua. No. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Allumage Vulcain, allumage des deux EAP et décollage. Right at the moment, as we speak, we're in between passes of the uh, Ariane 5 ATV uh, launch vehicle, the, um, and we've had separation just on half an hour, well, a few minutes ago actually. Um, everything was spot on over the back of Bluff, the launch vehicle, or the rocket, uh, separated from the payload, which is ATV, automated transfer vehicle, a 20 tonne cargo truck going to the International Space Station. And we were talking off camera about some of the interesting things on that payload. What, what is uh, contained in that rocket? Right, well, it's taking 6.6 .6 tonnes of supplies to the International Space Station. About 2.5 tonnes of that is equipment, clothes, 50 kilograms of it is coffee. So, you know, if you're an astronaut, I'm sure you want uh, coffee from time to time to wake up in the morning, keep you going. Freeze dried, maybe. Uh, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> But there's also oxygen and water, which I guess you need the water for the coffee, so pretty important. But also it's got about four tonnes of um, fuel for the International Space Station to uh, keep its uh, station positioning and uh, keep it in orbit. Consumer affairs have raised concerns over a looming safety issue relating to a new crafty craze. Loom bands are small colourful rubber bands looped together using plastic hook and a loom board and is proving popular with crafty Kiwis. But consumer affairs are warning parents the small bands are a choking risk for the under threes and can cause circulatory problems if children wrap bands around fingers or toes for any length of time. A child was blinded in the UK after a band was accidentally pinged into his eye while another little boy nearly lost two fingers. Consumer affairs say to ensure young people are supervised and to keep bands away from small children and pets. Southlanders are being asked to keep an eye not just on the road but on road signs. Removing redundant signs is good for road safety and it's with this in mind the Southland District Council is asking people to report road signs that are no longer relevant. Areas that may have had a change of activity such as hall closures or cyclists no longer riding a stretch of road may have signs that are unnecess an unnecessary distraction to drivers. There's different types of signage, uh, warning signs, regulatory signs, so the, the main focus is probably more around the warning signs, particularly signs such as uh, school bus turn signs or um, children's signs, uh, particularly in the rural area where you might have had three or four houses where kids have now grown up, they've left home or they've changed schools. Um, so it's really getting feedback uh, where these situations have changed and those signs are no longer applicable. Uh, we don't want too many signs out there because then people start ignoring them. So the signs that we do have out on the road, we want them to be uh, applicable and people to take note of them. Um, so that's really the key behind that. Do you have an estimate of how many redundant signs may be out on the roads at the moment? Um, no, we don't at present. Um, we are taking signs down and putting new signs up um, all the time as we become aware of them. So it, it does make it a bit difficult to gauge exactly. But um, as I said, because situations might change, a family might leave or fam new families might move into your area, um, to try and keep track of that all the time can be uh, pretty tricky. 
And what about if families do move into an area and they would request a um, children walking sign or something like that? Is it something that council will provide? Uh, it's something that council um, can look at. There is criteria that we look at meeting because, again, we don't want um, necessarily signs all over the place and then people become a bit blasé about the signs and start ignoring them. So the signs that do go up need to be effective. Uh, you don't, as an example, you don't want a, um, say, children sign up, but then every time somebody travels down that road, they never see any children, then they start ignoring the sign, and then the, the sign becomes ineffective. So it's trying to find that balance. Experienced modeler Bob Hatsuika has been commissioned by the South Museum to build a one-sixth scale diorama of a section of the New Zealand position at Anzac Cove in 1915. The Dutch-born modeler says the project is a challenge, but it's one he's more than up to. I had a, uh, a question from the South Museum if I was interested in uh, setting up a one-sixth Gallipoli commemorative display. And because I am in that one six scale uh, stuff anyway, I thought yeah, that is a great opportunity plus a great honor for me to, to show my feelings towards the commemoration. Let's talk about the logistics of it because the, you are actually manufacturing your uniforms. The figures are, uh, may, are retail available, aren't they? Yeah, but you're adapting them and how many will you end up and how big will it be? Uh, the whole display is going to contain around about the 25 figurines which are available on the market, but the uniforms and, and other bits and there pieces... There aren't any World War One options, are there? Not much. There are some bits and pieces available, but it's very limited, so you have to be very creative and make it yourself. And so you're actually t making the uniforms and some of the um, armaments and, and ammunition and things yourself? That's correct, yeah. yeah. So I've got all the templates already sitting there and uh, my needles are, are waiting for me to uh, start working. <laughs> and how, how long have you got? I'm guessing April. April should be all uh, been done and dusted and, and on display in the museum. Next to that I have to also make a, a smaller scale uh, display for the museum and it's a scale 132nd and that's going to be like a three dimensional uh, wall painting that's going to be mounted on the wall. Is going to represent the trenches and the tunneling done by the Turks in uh, on Gallipoli. Which is something we don't hear or read much about, but they were actually sapping underneath the uh, Anzacs, weren't they? Yeah, that's correct, and that was for me also a learning curve because I actually don't know anything about Gallipoli or World War I except the stuff that happened in, in Europe. So yeah, that was for me already an eye-opener from they were already tunneling in those days. Stay with us after the break, the final in our series of three interviews with retiring MP for Invercargill, Eric Roy. Welcome back, our final instalment in our series this week on the last week in Parliament of MP for Invercargill, Eric Roy. Tonight, MMP and Republicanism. But first, just how important is life experience for an MP? Is Todd Barclay too young to start a parliamentary career at just 24? Uh, I'm well known for, for making a few statements about things. And one of the things I've said about MPs is that they shouldn't be in Parliament till they've had a bad lambing. That's a metaphorical <laughs> statement, um, meaning that you've been in a position where you can't change the course of events and have had to dig into your re personal reserves to handle a situation. That's probably preferable. Um, Todd's a very talented young fellow, but if you look across the spectrum of who we've got, Todd, I think, is 24. We've got a guy standing against Ruth Dyson, and you might want to watch what happens on the night, a guy called Nook Karako. He's 62, I think. So that's the spectrum of what we put up, and we talked earlier about our system of selecting people. And these people have persuaded the delegates they're the best people to do the job. So rather than have an age, there's an ability thing, and so you get that broad church approach. So you're not putting in a whole bunch of little clones that are all going to think and perform and act the same way. And so, you know, Todd's a talented guy, and I think he'll do very well. So a good mix of perhaps those professional parliamentarians versus those that step in out of the private sector? Oh, yeah, absolutely there is, and uh, very, very interesting people with some very colourful careers across a whole spectrum of things. C can I just ask you, is there anyone in the opposition who you are great mates with? 
Well, I lost my best mate, Shane Jones. Um, he, he, he was good. Um, he may be back, though. I yeah. mean, there's rumour that he will leave New Zealand first uh, after well, we'll, Winston. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah, look, um, strangers are friends I haven't met yet, Hunter. I get on pretty well with most people. Um, and I've got some good friends on the other side. Um, it's, it's a funny place. A lot of people form opinions on the sound bites that come out of question time that are shown on the news. But in the select committees and across in a whole lot of ways, um, you actually um, have some quite interesting relationships. Um, similarly, um, probably the fiercest competition is actually in your own team. And I think it was Gladstone that said, I stand in the house facing the opposition surrounded by my enemies. Um, because it's a very competitive environment as you asked me, did I want to be a minister? Yes, I did, but so does everybody. So that's what makes the competitive thing. And in a way, that's the driver, because those people that are pulling their weight, um, producing the good policy, doing the persuasive stuff out there, they're the ones that kind of get rewarded. So that competitiveness gives you a tension that actually drives a better machine. Do you think that politics then is in good heart in New Zealand? That the, 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 the coattailing of people st standing MPs down in seats, can, uh, candidates down in seats, is this all good for New Zealand politics, do you think? I, and I'm not pointing the finger at yeah, national. Yeah, I no, mean, no, Labor's no. done similar things, but uh, is that good? Is that good? Well, well uh, th that sort of behaviour is a product of MMP. When we had first past the post, we had a, a different product. We had people trying to engineer seats so that the number of seats might not have reflected what the overall vote was. So people react to the situation. Maybe it's a bit more open yeah. now, is that what you now, well, well, yeah, I think there's more visibility about that stuff. But, but I would say this, if you look at systems of governance around the world, MMP is not a favoured one. It, it's in about six places. Now, there's probably a reason for that. They're either very enlightened and everybody else isn't, or other forms um, provide a more stable form that uh, has greater acceptance. And in actual fact, if you look at what the predominant one is, an upper lower house, Senate, Congress, uh, lower house, upper house kind of an approach. And we used to have that up until 1951 in New Zealand. I tried to get our team to actually have a look at that as an option when we had that last uh, referendum on it, but we ruled it out because of cost. But the House is still there. We've still got the red carpet and all that stuff in Parliament. And uh, I still would have liked us to consider that. And for me, the perfect system would be to have MMP in your upper house, which are the moderating house, and first past the post in the lower house. And all the legislation has to go through the upper house. And I would have thought that was the perfect system. Who would sit in that upper house? Though? Well, elected representatives under, an, under the ERIC system... <laughs> <laughs> which would have been an MMP system for the upper house and a lower house which was first past the post. So they would have been elected representatives. Where do you see New Zealand in 20 years? Do you think we'll elect our own president or will Parliament mm. elect a president very, or will Charles III reign? Uh, very interesting question. And, and I, am, um, I believe that the monarchy serves us very well at this stage in time. What will put that at risk will be the time that we end up, and MMP at one time will deliver this, a hung parliament when the kingmaker, whoever that is, can't actually cobble together uh, a majority. And the Governor-General will then have to make a call. Or partway through a term, when we get Walker jumping and all these other events, the Governor-General will have to make a call. At that point, New Zealand will say, should the person that makes that call be appointed or elected? And that's when we'll have the debate about republicanism. And Eric Roy's view on that? Uh, still working Neutral. through it. No, it'll be the upper house, lower house. <laughs> and that's all from the news desk this Wednesday. Sport follows the weather next from the news team. Good night.